This case is known as the House of Horrors, considered one of the most gruesome cases ever recorded in Germany. On the 21st of April 2016 in Lower Saxony, a couple with a broken down car called an ambulance for their passenger, who was seriously ill. Their passenger, who was identified as Suzanne F., unfortunately died seven hours after admission to the Helios Hospital. When an autopsy was conducted on her body, deep bruises and blunt force trauma on her head were discovered. This led police to arrest the couple, Wilfried W., and his longtime partner, Angelika W. This happened the following day, using a warrant for manslaughter from the Höxer District Court. According to police investigations, the injuries Suzanne suffered happened in the house the couple shared, and unearthed other crimes that the couple had committed. Angelika gave details about other crimes they had conducted, like that of the 33-year-old Annika W., who hailed from Usla Dinkelhausen. According to her, Annika had married Wilfried and moved into the house after she split up with him in the summer of 2013. In the fall of 2014, Annika died, but the couple chose to freeze her body, then dismembered it, burned it, and spread her ashes all over town. They then deregistered her from the residence registration office, stating that she had moved to Amsterdam. Another victim they held hostage was a 51-year-old woman from Berlin, whom they had mistreated from August 2011 to March 2012. Luckily for this woman, she managed to escape from the house, but as luck would have it, the couple found her before she could leave town for Berlin. The twisted and shocking part about this story is after finding her, they took her to the Ursula police station to confirm in writing that she voluntarily lived with them and wasn't mistreated in any way. Despite this report, there was no follow-up from the police, basically giving them the green light to do whatever they wanted. When further searches were conducted in the couple's house, a collection of forced farewell letters from victims was recovered, and Angelica provided more information by writing down a list of seven names of victims they had held hostage, detailing the type of mistreatment they had meted against them. By the end of May 2016, the police reported that four abused women had been identified, but more tips were coming from the public on victims of the couple. The number grew from 4 to 61, for the period between 1998 to April 2016. These cases were confirmed through false self-accusatory letters the woman stated to have written while in the house. In September 2016, Wilfried and Angelika were accused of murder by omission. There were 48 witnesses during their trial, and Angelika gave detailed confessions. The two accused each other during the trial. And in November 2017, the expert who was handling Wilfried's admission of guilt had to be relieved of his duties due to long-term illness that kept pushing the case hearings. On October 5, 2018, the couple was found guilty, which led to Angelika receiving a 13-year prison sentence, while Wilfried was sentenced to 11 years. In a more interesting twist, the prosecution side had pushed for a life sentence, but the court determined that since Angelika had willingly given confessions that collaborated with witness statements and Wilfried was seen as a less culpable participant due to his weak-mindedness, a life sentence was out of the question. After Wilfried and Angelika were incarcerated, the owners of their house sold it to other people. The new buyers opted to illegally grow cannabis inside, and so they were sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. Due to the record of the horrors that had occurred in this house, it had become a site of sensational tourism, as onlookers curiously visited to see it, making the neighbors uncomfortable. The house was eventually transferred to the ownership of the state and later demolished in April 2022. Also guys, if you're enjoying this video, please make sure to subscribe. Let's see how far we can get this year. George Sodini was behind the infamous Bridgeville LA fitness shooting, responsible for the passing of three women and injuring another nine. George would chronicle his frustrations and rejections with women on his own website and even on his own YouTube channel. Open it up. Oh, someone left it unlocked. That's not good. Inside, okay. And George had become very isolated, unable to find a partner. Desperate and suffering from loneliness, George was very vocal about his situation. Although George didn't have these issues in his earlier life, he had multiple sex partners, was well off financially, was quite athletic, and honestly doesn't look unattractive. This would change in later years as he didn't have any partner for almost two decades. In a home vlog video he uploaded to YouTube, we get an insight into his living conditions. This is my house from the street. Here is my car. This is a two bedroom brick ranch. My car is an 07 Altima. I paid 79000 for this in 1996. That's considered a lot, believe it or not. Here's my big screen TV. It's my computer. Computer is connected to the stereo, which I listen to my MP3s and everything else. 
Okay, couch and chair, they match. The woman will be really be impressed. While most of this isn't too interesting for the overall case, there is one scene which definitely is of importance. Okay, come over here. There's some reading material that we're all familiar with. Here we can clearly see a book named Date Young Women, which shows that George's loneliness led him to seek out advice from others to have a better understanding on how to attract and date women. This desperation led George to even attend dating seminars. And also kind of establishing boundaries in my life between personal business and just allow my time. Okay, and you people don't know what that means, but that's, uh, hey, you want to do what I do, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, you have to bring him down a pig. George was mostly reserved unto himself and didn't really talk to the women there. Keep in mind though that these seminars are mostly rip-offs. You pay exorbitant amounts of money just to attend these and you're then persuaded to invest even more in buying the guru's books or other products. It's just people taking advantage of lonely and isolated men that just don't know any better. George was financially obviously very well off, so he was the perfect prey. Regardless of what George did, he just couldn't improve and felt more insecure than ever before. This is when he uploaded his second and at the same time last video to YouTube titled Hide from Emotion. It is easy for me to hide from my emotions for one more day. Take a long drive in the car, listen to some music, daydream, or just do some mundane task around the house that really doesn't need to be done, that's, that's not too important. And there you go, one more day. And one more day turns into one more year. Now, um, RDS says that I have approximately maybe 15 more years to be successful at this. And when I heard that, I wanted to continue immediately to, to start moving on this. I didn't realize I had that much time. So but my objective is to be real and to learn to be emotional and to, you know, to be able to emotionally connect with people. Because when I'm 10 to 20 years older than she is, you know, she has to feel good about this thing. And the only way to, around that, you know, is, is to work on this and perhaps STEM exercises or, or forgiveness exercises as per hey or, or whatever else. I'm going to post this and see what comes back. After this, he created his own website where he would chronicle his feelings. With each post, it would turn into a manifesto, where he would share his plan to go to a fitness studio and take the lives of as many women as possible before ending himself. I won't be going through the entire thing here, but I will read out the main parts of the very last post he wrote, which reads, August 3, 2009. I took off today, Monday, and tomorrow to practice my routine and make sure it is well polished. I need to work out every detail. There is only one shot. Oh, so I need to be completely immersed into something before I can be successful. I haven't had a drink since Friday at about 2.30. Total effort needed. Tomorrow is a big day. Unfortunately, I talked to my neighbor today, who is very positive and upbeat. I need to remain focused and absorbed completely. Last time I tried this, in January, I chickened out. Let's see how this new approach works. Maybe soon I will see God and Jesus. At least that is what I was told. Eternal life does not depend on works. If it did, we will all be in hell. Christ paid for every sin. So how can I or you be judged by God for a sin when the penalty was already paid? People judge, but that doesn't matter. I was reading the Bible and the integrity of God beginning yesterday, because soon I will see them. I will try not to add any more entries because this computer clicking distracts me. Also, any of the practice papers left on my coffee table I use or the notes in my gym bag can be published freely. I won't be embarrassed because, well, I will be dead. Some people like to study that stuff. Maybe all this will shed insight on why some people just cannot make things happen in their life, which can potentially benefit others. You need to keep in mind that he was running this blog for multiple months and you could clearly tell that he was posing a threat to the public. However, back then, the internet wasn't widely accessed as it is today and his website most likely had very little to no traffic, so it's no surprise that no one reported this to the police. In the end, he carried out his plan in the LA Fitness, taking the lives of three and injuring nine others. The injured people all survived. The beaches of the Salish Sea near Vancouver and Seattle have witnessed a discovery of more than 20 severed human feet from 2007 to 2023. The beaches of the Salish Sea are a treasure heaven for beachcombers who retrieve things like pottery, beach glass and rare shells. So when the human feet started coming up, it was an alarming feature for the residents. The first discovery was made by a 12-year-old girl 
who was walking along the beach on Jodida Island in August of 2007. She reports seeing a blue and white running shoe, which upon closer inspection she found contained a human foot. A week later, another foot was discovered on Gabriella Island and didn't match, since they were both right feet with different shoes. An officer expressing a shock and suspicion told the Vancouver Sun, finding one foot is like a million to one odd, but finding two is crazy. I've heard of two left feet dancers, but come on. As more feet washed up on the beaches, there were speculations into how the feet came to be, with the most common being that the feet were from the victims of serial killers, drowned immigrants, or victims of a plane crash. Some feet were matched to people thought deceased or missing, while others remain anonymous. In an attempt to solve the mystery of these feet, researchers and authorities joined efforts to understand the behaviors of the human body underwater. In particular, National Geographic reported that when someone drowns on the ocean, their body is quickly devoured by sea life once they hit the ocean floor, meaning their body parts are quickly separated. The Salish Sea has strong winds and currents, which makes it transport the dismembered feet towards the shores. You might be wondering, why are the feet the only ones that make it to the shores and not other body parts? Well, the feet have been found in sports shoes, which have a high buoyancy, and if air pockets get trapped in the shoes, they easily float and are washed ashore. In early 2023, a foot in a hiking boot was found on the shores and matched to a fisherman who went missing 25 years ago. Why would a foot be discovered 25 years later? The Federal Institute of Ocean Sciences claims that the Salish Sea region has a lot of recirculation, through which tidal currents could keep floating objects recirculating within the system for years before they are discovered. Claudine Didi's Blancar's body was discovered in June of 2015 by police in her house in Springfield, a few days after her death. Her body has several stab wounds and was laying in a pool of blood. But why is her case interesting? Didi had a daughter named Gypsy Rose, born in 1991, and who apparently had chronic conditions like leukemia, asthma, muscular dystrophy, and a low mental capacity from being born prematurely. At 8 years old, Didi began making up health issues that Gypsy suffered from even though she was completely healthy, telling her that she needs to use a walker and later a wheelchair. Why did she tell you you had to be on a walker? She said that I had muscular dystrophy. But did you feel any different the day before you got the walker than the day you did have the walker? No, sir. You were able to run around? Pretty much, yes. And would you forget to get it and run into the kitchen? There would be times that I'd forget to grab it and then go to walk and then my mom would catch me and be like, use your walker. From the symptoms and illnesses that Didi claimed her daughter had, a collection of medications was issued to Gypsy, including sleeping when on a breathing machine. Gypsy was also subjected to an array of unnecessary surgeries under her mother's watch, including the removal of salivary glands, which combined with the many medicines, led to the removal of her teeth due to rotting. Imagine the pain she went through as her mother confined her to a wheelchair, yet she could walk fine and was constantly fed through a feeding tube. When doctors gave contradicting diagnoses to those that Didi wanted, she would stop seeing them and go elsewhere. Also, note that Didi was a trained nurse, so she could manipulate the diagnosis and symptoms to fit what she wanted. She was so committed to the lie that her husband believed that the daughter suffered from a chromosomal disorder, which resulted in multiple health issues for Gypsy. You know, and I asked her, I said, man, she's got, you know, she's got a lot of issues. What's going on, you know? And uh, they had done some tests and found out she had a chromosome disorder that was causing all of her uh, functions from developing her digestive system and her muscular system. Didi told me she, she's, she's not gonna live to be, you know, 18 years old, she, she may be an old, an old teenager, that, that's about it. As time would have it, the immediate family noticed that Gypsy never needed a wheelchair and neither suffered from all of those illnesses. This prompted Didi to move elsewhere with her daughter and ensure she never talked to anyone about her condition. This commitment saw Gypsy receive benefits from charity organizations, including the Habitat for Humanity, who with them a home equipped with ramps for a wheelchair. And it's all for this family, Dee Dee Blanchard and her 12-year-old daughter, Gypsy Rose. It's been a blessing. People have been so nice to us. It feels like we finally came home. It is wonderful. It's so beautiful and happy and home. You might be wondering if the authorities ever caught Dee Dee for what she was doing to her daughter. Well, they did, but she managed to convince them of her daughter's illnesses. Over time, Gypsy met a man online, with whom she plotted how she could escape from her mother. She successfully ran off with the man, but Dee Dee caught up with him, which resulted in her physical restraining and abuse at home in the following days. 
In 2015, however, she met Nicholas Gilchill on a Christian online mingling platform. She confided with him of her mother's actions and requested him to help her kill Didi, just so they could be together. In June of that year, Nicholas did as they planned. He came to the house and took Didi's life, while Gypsy was hiding in the bathroom with her ears covered. They then left her mother's lifeless body and moved to Nicholas' home in Wisconsin. In the days that followed, Gypsy started posting strange posts on Facebook, with one reading, that B is dead. Neighbors of Didi who saw the post eventually called the police to inspect the house, which is when they found her body in the bedroom. This poor woman had done nothing but give her life for her child and had done nothing but love everybody around her. I could not think of anybody who would want to cause any kind of harm to Dee Dee and Gypsy. Gypsy and Nicholas were eventually arrested for the crime. She confessed that she wanted her mother's body to be discovered, so she posted disturbing posts about her on Facebook. In 2018, a Missouri jury convicted Nicholas and gave him a life sentence without parole, while Gypsy received a 10-year sentence that ends in 2026. 68-year-old Tamara Samsonova came to light in July of 2015 when she was arrested for taking the life of 79-year-old Valentina Nikolaevna Ulanova. In March of 2015, Tamara's house was undergoing renovation, so a mutual friend requested Valentina to accommodate her for a while, which she accepted. Samsonova was set to like living in Ulanova's house and didn't want to go back to her house, despite Ulanova's requests that she do so as the relationship got rocky over time. In July, Samsonova traveled to Pushkin and got a prescription drug that she put 50 pills of on a salad that Ulanova ate. When Ulanova consumed the salad on the night of 23rd of July, she passed away in the kitchen. Samsonova then dismembered the body using knives and a saw and packed the body parts in trash bags which she disposed of in a pond near Ulanova's house. A few days later, a couple was walking their dog on a trail surrounding the pond and the dog led them to the trash bags. With authorities now involved in the retrieval of the body parts, they started a neighborhood investigation of any missing persons, which led them to the house where both were staying. A quick sweep across the room proved beyond doubt that the crime had taken place in the house, with some body parts recovered too. Samsonova immediately told the investigating officer that Ilonova had insulted her, and she chose to end her life. With Samsonova arrested, more searches were done in her room and the renovated house, where several journals detailing her crimes were found. In one entry, she stated exactly what she did and where she hid the parts. More entries were discovered, but the one detailing how she lived with Lenova was quite interesting. She started by saying how she was fond of Lenova and enjoyed staying with her, so she didn't want to go back to her house. As part of her confession, she took the investigating officers to Lenova's house and showed them how she cut Lenova's body into pieces and wrapped them in shower curtains using a dummy body. She also claimed that Ulanova was too heavy, so she disposed of some parts in the backyard, then bought the head and hands in a saucepan, then threw them in the garbage, which had already been collected by the town service. The home security footage captures Samsonova carrying the plastic bags from the house on several trips, which further implicated her. It is also suspected that Samsonova took the life of her husband and got rid of the body, but no evidence has come up yet. She reported his disappearance to the authorities in the year 2000, stating that he escaped with another woman. The search efforts didn't bear any results, and the case was eventually abandoned. Before moving into Ulanova's house, Samsonova was renting out a room in her apartment, but neighbors stated that the roommates would move in and move out sooner rather than later. Samsonova confessed to having taken 13 lives, which were largely cold cases. Her journal entries helped close in on these cases, spanning more than 12 years before the date of her arrest. She also confessed to partaking in cannibalism of her victim's lungs. During her sentencing, she blew kisses to the reporters present and told them that she wasn't happy about their presence as her neighbors and town would know what she had done. She was sentenced to life in a mental hospital. Mikkel was arrested in 2013 in North Carolina, USA for an attempted murder of a North Carolina trooper and sentenced to 24 years. Before this attempted crime by shooting, Mikkel had already crossed paths with the law as he was a fugitive in Vermont and was wanted for violating his parole there. During his fourth year in prison in 2017, he and three other inmates took the lives of four prison workers using hammers and scissors only. Mikkel, alongside inmates Jonathan Monk, Weiss Saw Buchmann and Seth Frazier, stabbed and bludgeoned them as they attempted an escape. Their victims were Mrs. Veronica Darden, 
the Correctional Enterprise Manager, Officers Justin Smith and Wendy Shannon, and Geoffrey Hove, a maintenance worker. They were discovered during the escape by one correctional officer, whom they immediately attacked, together with the three other witnesses. According to the autopsy report, the victims had a lot of inflicted damage on their bodies. After the attack, Mikhail saw a fire within the sewing shop to distract the guards and continue with the attempt. During his court sessions, he informed the court that he was upset over his 24-year sentence, and he didn't see if he had anything to lose by attempting to escape jail. He also confessed to the investigating officer that he started planning his escape since the day he landed in the institution, and in short, he got allocated to work at the warehouse to access tools and understand the pathways out of the prison. In the court session footage, Brady can be seen smiling as he shares the horrifying details about how he went about attacking his victims, with no sign of remorse. I'm up here, I'm, I'm up here to tell the truth. You can ask me anything you want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the truth. How it was, whether it hurts me, whether it helps me, I don't care about that. Answer, you don't believe you're crazy, do you? No, I don't think I'm crazy, no. And you do know the difference between right and wrong? Yes. So you know murder is wrong? Murder is a different name for a death, but yes. What if it's decided that he'd received the capital punishment? He didn't flinch or show any form of emotion and was taken to central prison in Relic. In 2019, he was transferred to the US penitentiary Big Sandy in Enos, Kentucky, as a security precaution. The measure came a week after his conviction. He attempted an escape by jumping over the prison fence, but was captured before he could escape. As of 2018, Mikel had been convicted of 10 other crimes while in jail. The gruesome crime against the four officers went on record as a deadly attempted prison breakout in North Carolina's history. His defense keeps appealing his sentences, so he's bound to spend several years in the justice correctional system serving other convictions before undergoing the capital punishment. In their arguments, the defense places his upbringing and the constant watch at Pescoteng Prison as challenges that mentally wait on him, in an attempt to get a lesser punishment, I guess. In a way, we can say that Brady has an affinity for taking the life of others. He cannot let an opportunity to end someone's life by passing. I haven't uploaded a video for this format in a very long time. So if you're new, make sure to check out the first episode by clicking here. Thank you to all who support on Patreon, it's greatly appreciated.